Kia ora tata katoa. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for your warm welcome. It's really great to be with you, and I feel very much at home here, particularly hanging out with former students from both Cudston and CMS and some present students also, so it's really good to be with you. God is good? All the time. All the time? God is good. For that is God's nature. God is love? Are you sure? <laughs> God is love. All the time. All the time. God is love. For that is God's nature. I was really moved this morning in the Eucharist to hear that today is the Memorial Day for Bishop John Patterson because he's actually part of my story. I grew up at St Andrew's Martyrs Memorial Church in Kohi Marama in Auckland. It was a Martyrs Memorial Church for the Martyrs of Melanesia. And regularly during my childhood, the Melanesian Brotherhood would come to our church when I was studying at St John's Theological College just around the corner. So it was moving to remember Bishop John Patterson. Also, of course, not just the European martyr, but the Melanesian martyrs. And I guess that's appropriate for us to begin to think about lament and hope. <coughs> the person next to me said it's all in the end, lament and hope. Um, so I'd like us to think about that in this session and in the next session which is in a World Cafe format and if you want to know what World Cafe is come and experience it, it we'll be looking at lament as resistance. So I've entitled this talk, There are things that can be seen only with eyes that have cried, which I thought was a very moving testimony from Ar Roman Catholic Archbishop Christopher Munzi Hiawa, who was the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Bukavu in Congo from 1994 to 1996 before he was martyred. And I guess lament is something that Steve, my husband and I have been thinking about for 27 years, on and off, and I'll tell you why. So I'm going to start with a personal story. So 27 years ago, we experienced a kind of life-changing event, I guess. When we were New Zealand CMS mission partners in Lubumbashi in Congo Zaire, Zaire as it was then. And we'd been there for about 18 months or two years when our, and, uh, we'd gone with our first child, Daniel, and we, by then we had our second daughter, Katie. We had travelled on a long and difficult journey from Lubumbashi to Kasaji, which is way over in the west of Congo, near the Angolan border to share in some community health workshops and to discuss some ideas for developing a health centre there. My husband's a doctor. During our visit there, our daughter Katie, who was 14 months then, became increasingly unwell and then got quite very seriously ill. And there's no hospital there, and although Steve's a doctor, I guess when it's your own family, he really wasn't much use. Um, that's quite a different thing, isn't it? And we feared that she had malaria, we tried to give her regular teaspoons of anti-malarial medication. None of it would stay down. She was just throwing up all the time. Her fever was peaking during the night. We were praying. We were desperate. We really thought she was going to die. We prayed. We entreated God. We prayed. We pled with God. We prayed. She didn't improve. We were so desperate. It was late at night. Finally, we thought we would ask the pastor to pray with us. We just wanted some company. We wanted someone to help us. We knocked on his door. We knew he was there because we could hear his radio going. We knocked on the door. We banged on the door. We shouted. We asked him to come out. No answer. Tried again. No answer. So we really could not understand this. Could he not hear us? <laughs> again, we tried in vain. Still no answer. So we carried on trying to give Katie medication unsuccessfully. <clears throat> we prayed to a God who didn't seem to answer. He seemed to be absent, just like the pastor. It was a very long night. But eventually, Katie did come through. She is now a healthy, vibrant 28-year-old who's just started her GP training in Cardiff. When we returned to Lubumbashi, we discovered a letter, this was before the days of email, from friends in New Zealand who had been praying for our trip to Kasaji, and they had specifically prayed that none of us would be ill and that we would especially be protected from malaria. So how do we understand that? Did God answer our prayers? Maybe Katie didn't have malaria. She did recover. Where was God when we prayed? At the time, it seemed to us that God was absent and silent. We received no comfort from God. 
We couldn't even rouse the pastor to come and pray with us. Had God let us down? So for those terrible 24 hours, long, terrible hours, we found ourselves in a situation common to much of humanity, lonely, distressed and suffering, in a situation over which we had no power or control, nothing we could do would make Katie any better, and moreover in a situation where it appeared that God had left us. And in some ways I'm not sure if I've ever really made sense, if we have ever really made sense of that situation, which is why I call it a life-changing experience which has lived with us and has etched on our memories ever since. So this summer I read a very interesting book that has begun to help me make sense of this. It's called Born from Lament, The Theology of Politics and Hope in Africa. It's by a Roman Catholic Ugandan theologian called Emmanuel Kotongale. And this is a book that looks squarely at the terrible, evil, cruel violence and tragic suffering in Congo, particularly recently, and it begins to reflect on how and why this has happened. He details the trauma and the depth of loss experienced, the loss of community, the loss of humanity, the loss of future. I'm sure you know some of the horror and the suffering of what's been going on in Congo recently. Children taken from their villages and told to kill their relatives. A 2011 study showed that 1,152 women were raped every day during that recent conflict, a rate of 48 women per hour. An American study showed that 12% of all Congolese women have been raped at least once. I won't elaborate further, the stories are truly chilling. And so Katongale asks, how do we live with this? How do we make sense of this? Can there be a future, and if so, what kind? And where is God? And he finds the clue, he finds the clue to the future in the power and hope of lament. So he believes that in the face, the face of such pain and trauma, the church in Africa, he's particularly talking about the church in Africa, but I think it applies worldwide. The church everywhere needs to learn how to lament. He suggests that the African church tends to focus on a powerful God, a God who performs miracles, who is mighty to save and who reigns supreme, all of which is true, of course, but that we also need to know how to lament in the face of pain and suffering and trauma. And of course, the counterpoint to our almighty God is the crucified God, seen in Jesus Christ on the cross, who continues to suffer with and among us. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. So with some insights from Katongale, um, a few comments from a Roman Catholic New Zealand theologian, an amazing example from an incredible woman from Burundi. We're going to watch a couple of clips. And with your help around the tables in discussion, I'd like to consider um, the following themes. So lament as complaint, lament as resistance, justice, and innovation. And we'll look at that a bit more in the World Cafe workshop also. And finally, lament as newness and hope. So, Katongale reminds us that for Israel, for the people of Israel, their safety and security were not found in military might and strength, not in the extra police forces around London at the moment, not in their wealth or cyber security that we might crave today, but, obviously, in their covenant relationship with Yahweh. Yes, the Israelites praised God, but they also protested at God, didn't they? They railed against injustice, and they pressed God for deliverance. And we see this especially in the Psalms. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's probably interesting, I think, just to be reminded of the 150 Psalms. Anyone know what percentage of the Psalms are Psalms of lament? 40%. 
So of the 150 psalms, 60 of them, or 40%, are known as psalms of lament. There are psalms of praise, psalms of thanksgiving, royal psalms, but the largest single category is psalms of lament. So that tells us something, doesn't it? So this meant that the core of Israel's life, social, social religious, and community, was framed by lament. And there's a generally recognized structure to these psalms of lament with five elements. So there's the five elements. Can you see Psalm 13 there? Is it, is it large enough for you to be able to see? Because I thought perhaps we could read it out together. So those of you who can see it, let's read it. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes. I say, sleep of the death. My enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Thank you. So those elements up there, they're not found in all Psalms of Lament, but they do signify a kind of turning to God, which reflects a deep intimacy with God. A relationship of trust, intimacy, and love is a necessary precondition for genuine lament. When the biblical writers lament, they do so from within the context of a foundational relationship that binds together the individual with members of the community of faith and that community with their God. So Katongale reminds us that biblical lament is not a kind of unrestrained whining at God, nor a kind of angry venting, but rather it is actually a structured and complex language of complaint, protest and appeal directed to God. And so this makes it a distinct language of faith a distinct faith language with its own vocabulary and grammar for those intimate and difficult conversations with God when we are hurting. And another important facet, which I'll talk about again towards the end, that we notice is that lament often moves into praise. The lament and songs of thanksgiving belong together in Israel's worship. I think what is great is they have the confidence to express the entire range of human emotions before God, doubt and faith, joy and sorrow, trust and fear, life and death. Such is the confidence born out of the covenant relationship and a sign of the depth of their relationship with the living God because after all, what kind of relationship would it be if we can only express our joy and faith? but not our needs, our sorrow, our pain, our trauma, our affliction, even our complaints. So listen now to um, Father Jerry Arbuckle. He is a Kiwi, so you'll get the accent. And he's just gonna talk for about three or four minutes on mourning and lament. This is him. Grief is an important thing, but it's an inevitable experience of sadness over loss. But grief by itself is extremely dangerous. It requires the gift of mourning, which is an active reaction in faith to grief. I, I, I'll argue this afternoon that the Roman Church has been wallowing in an avalanche of unarticulated grief because to mourn is to dissent. And unless we allow people to express their anger and their sadness over what they are experiencing through many, many losses, then those people begin to be suffocated by uh, excessive grief and again lose energy and the prophetic disintegrates. Well, to me, at the heart of the gospel is, is the gift of mourning. The gift of mourning is to name what is lost 
in order to allow the new to enter. And that new is a resurrection in whatever form it may take. So that whole dynamic of the Paschal mystery is at the very heart, I believe, of refounding. But we, to experience grief is normal. To experience mourning is not normal. Because order does not like mourning. Because mourning requires people uh, to dissent from the status quo. No, no, because we're not just an intellect on two intellectual legs. We are human persons. And uh, grief is something that affects the human body. Um, not just the, 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 the soul. It, it's, the, it, it's, it's, we're a human being with body and soul. And we experience loss. And through loss, we experience sadness. Even though the loss we know has to happen. But that loss um, must be named, and the naming of it is the ritual of mourning. And this is where pioneering is so crucial. Because if you're not leading a spirituality of mourning as an integral part of your ministry, you are in danger of suffocation. So the gift of mourning and lament. And uh, now I'd like to think about lament as complaint. I think that complaint is also a key component of lament. Expressions of complaint in the Psalms range from expressions of concerned, concern to utter desperation in the face of illness, before one's enemies, or protestations of innocence. However, to complain is risky, I think, and perhaps it almost seems a bit improper. But I also think that it shows that our relationship with God is alive. It's dynamic and open. It refuses to accept things the way they are. It protests God's silence and presses God for deliverance. I think this requires courage to protest in this way against God. But we see it again and again in the Psalms and in the prophets such as Jeremiah. And it may also be a way forward into newness. In the Psalms of Lament, while the writers draw on memories of God's saving actions in the past, there is always the risk and possibility that God will act in totally new ways as a result of this present suffering. So we may see and learn something totally new and unexpected about God. So this suggests that Israel understood complaint as an essential part of their covenant relationship with God. It's not those who lack faith who complain, but those recognized for strong faith who bring their most honest and passionate feelings to God. It ensures that the relationship is alive, dynamic, negotiated, contested. And I guess it's also risky because complaint is a form of protest. It challenges God. How long, O oh God? Why do you hide your face? It challenges God's silent silence. It puts God on the spot. The psalmists may say some outrageous things. You are the one who has done this to me. Remove your scourge from me. I'm overcome by the blow of your hand. What kind of God remains silent to his people's pleas? But perhaps God is silent not because God is unmoved, but because God himself laments and suffers with us. Jesus' incarnation and his cry of dereliction on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, testify to this reality. African-American gospel songs, the slave spirituals, are a powerful expression of their belief that God was with them in their suffering, even, they, even, though, even while sorry, they were living in what one writer has called their whirling vortex of God-forsakenness. Their whirling vortex of God-forsakenness. The slave songs are drenched in pain and sadness. <laughs> but they also speak of a resistance 
they also expressed a spirit of resistance and confidence and hope. And what gave them hope was the Exodus story, that ultimately God would save and rescue them. And also their identification of their own suffering with that of Christ's forsakenness on the cross. And I'm told by black South African friends that during the apartheid years in South Africa, the most popular services were the Good Friday services because they could identify with Jesus and his pain and suffering and desolation. Jesus understood the slaves, the oppressed, the anguish of apartheid, because he too knew misery, anguish, and forsakenness. And this resonance gave the slaves, gave the black South Africans under apartheid, the ability to endure and to hope. And ultimately, it was these spirituals that gave birth to the freedom songs of the American Civil Rights Movement. So Martin Luther King commented, the freedom songs are playing a strong and vital role in our struggle. They give the people new courage, hope, and a sense of unity. I think they keep alive a faith, a radiant hope in the future, particularly in our most trying hours. So what about us? How do we engage in lament? Walter Brueggemann and others have highlighted the absence of lament in our churches. Brueggemann connects it with the inability to face suffering and to embrace negativity in our Western world. Glenn Pemberton, another writer, suggests that the church as a middle-class institution, you can decide if we're that or not, I come from Oxford, I live in a very white, middle-class place. So Pemberton suggests that the church as a middle-class institution has become increasingly embarrassed by the earthy and gritty language of lament. He writes, we have chosen to live protected lives in insulated communities, whether our community is a middle to upper class neighborhood or a church with a fortress mentality. Our lack of solidarity with those in need is what causes us to wonder why these prayers are even in the Bible and to question who would ever need them. Another writer comments that it's because of our increased prosperity and identification with the mainstream. Lament sounds dreary and negative to those who do not wish to be reminded either of their own vulnerability and suffering or that of those around them. Alan Davis, an Old Testament scholar, has quite a hard-hitting exercise for us to think about. She offers these very challenging insights. She, she suggests that when we read Psalm 109, we turn it around 180 degrees so that it is directed towards us and ourselves and ask ourselves this question, is there anyone in the community of God's people who might want to say this to God about me, about us. Now, however environmentally aware we are, my daughter-in-law is an environmental warrior, so I always have to behave myself when they come home. And recently she's given a talk on sustainable sustainability. <laughs> however, which I need to read, uh, however environmentally aware we are, we are consumers. Our footprint is many times greater than those in the majority world. We are, I think it probably is not an overstatement to say, we are active participants in a rapacious industrial economy, regularly consuming far more than we need of the world's goods. In 2015, I was at the Anglican University in Bunia. In our house, we have, in our household, we have three laptops, two phones, and a tablet. In the Anglican University in Bunia, they have three computers for the entire university. An American dollar a half hour to get on the internet. Average salary of a pastor, $40 a month. So she says we are rapacious, we live in this rapacious industrial cons economy consuming far more than we need, and she j then projects this idea onto our grandchildren and great-grandchildren's generation to say nothing of the present majority world who might 
presently or in the future, cry out and lament to God. Let their memory be cut off from the earth because they did not remember to act in covenant faith. But how did a person poor and needy, crushed in heart, even to death? So she suggests we turn that round and ask that of ourselves. Hard hitting. And Brueggemann concludes, a community of faith which negates lament soon concludes that the hard issues of justice are improper questions to pose at the throne because the throne seems only to be a place of praise. I believe it thus follows that if justice questions are improper questions at the throne, they soon appear to be improper questions in public places, in schools, and hospitals, with the government, and eventually even in the courts. Justice questions disappear into civility and docility. A loss of lament can signify a loss of passion for social justice. So I would like you now to take a few minutes around your tables to just discuss together, do you agree that there's a loss of lament in your context? And if so, what might that signify? So just take a few minutes around your tables to discuss that question and then we'll carry on. Thank you. Sorry to have to close the discussion down. So I think sometimes we forget that lament can be a form of resistance and therefore can bring about newness and hope. We've already noted the African-American slave spirituals are a form of resistance. And I think this is really important to remember that lament is also a form of agency. A cry of anguish is not only a way of naming and mourning what is lost, but it's also a way of standing in the midst of the suffering. And so lament deepens our engagement with the world of suffering and therefore invites us into more active social and political engagement. So I want to offer you a dramatic example of this now by telling you Maggie Barankitze's story. She is a wonderful woman from Burundi. We're going to watch a clip in a moment. Let me just read you a brief introduction to her story from Katongale's book. Before the events of 1993 in Burundi, Maggie, a Tutsi, you know there was the Tutsi Hutu in Rwanda, the genocide was the Hutus murdering the Tutsis, in Burundi it was the other way around. So before the events of 1993 in Burundi, Maggie, a Tutsi, had already adopted children, three Tutsi and four Hutu. Following the assassination of the first democratically elected Hutu president, Melchior Ndayayi, on October the 21st, 1993, the country erupted into Hutu Tutsi ethnic massacres and counter massacres. Together with her seven children and a number of Hutu families, Maggie hid in the local bishop's residence. But, but on October the 24th, soldiers led by some of Maggie's Tutsi family members attacked the bishop's house, stripped and tied Maggie down on a chair, set the building on fire, and killed 72 people. Among them was Maggie's friend, Juliette, a Tutsi married to a Hutu. Juliette was going to be spared, but she offered herself to be killed with her husband, saying, I married not a Hutu, but the man I love. If you're going to kill my husband, you might as well kill me. She took her ch two children, Lisette, almost four, and Lydia, one and a half, laid them at Maggie's feet and asked Maggie to take care of them. Then they killed her. After the massacre, Maggie crawled into the chapel. She prayed as she cried, My mother taught me that you are a god of love. She lied to me. You are not love. God, why was I not killed? Why am I here? Why, O oh God? As she prayed and cried, she heard Chloe, one of her seven children, calling from the sacristy, Mama, we are here. All of us are here. The children had escaped by hiding. Bribing the militia with money, she managed to save another 25 children from the burning building and hide them in the cemetery. And as night fell, she sought refuge at the home of a German development worker. So we're now going to watch a seven-minute clip about Maggie and what happened after that event.
At a mass grave in eastern Burundi, Maggie Barankitsi remembers the unthinkable. It happened in 1993 at the Catholic bishop's residence where she worked. It's very hard. As ethnic violence exploded across the country, men with machetes invaded and unleashed a nightmare, separating ethnic Hutu people from ethnic Tutsis. They took off my clothes and then they tied me and they said, your punishment that you keep silence, we will kill them in front of you. They began to kill priests, nuns, all the, the Hutu they know. When the bloodbath was over, 72 people were dead. And I stay alone among those bodies. I don't want to go. Over the following days, she risked her life to bury the victims. It, you can't imagine, I don't, 15 years after, I still wondering why, why? What do you do after something so horrific? For Maggie, the answer was extraordinary. I am Christian and I know that our human vocation is to love. I will try to, to make new generation Hutu and Tutsi together. As a war unfolded that would last 12 years and take 300,000 lives, she gathered orphans, dozens at first, then hundreds, then thousands as her own. I took those children with confidence because I believe that God is God. He will help me. Maggie established Maison Shalom, the house of peace, to restore these children. Her belief was that they needed education and love. And despite all they'd lost, a real home. So her children live not in orphanages, but in houses, caring for each other in small groups, living as a family. They have a future because it's their home. They have, when they leave school, they said, we go home. Throughout the war, they lived as a testament to peace. Maggie's children work together in businesses they own and run, including a salon, a tailor and seamstress shop, a mechanic school called the Garage of Angels, where former child soldiers, street children, and war orphans learn a skill and earn a living. Even their teacher is a child of Maison Shalom. I can't imagine what I would have become because of the war, but everything I am now is thanks to Maison Shalom. Over the years, Maggie added a library, language classes, computer lessons. And to prove to the children they deserved more than just survival, she built them a cinema and opened a swimming pool. Shalom was born to say no to the war, to say yes to the love, yes to the life. With Maggie, Maison Shalom is open to everyone so that healing, even in unspeakable circumstances, can truly take place. Aline's family was killed in the war. When she was only five, rebel soldiers attacked her with machetes and rocks and left her for dead. Maggie raised Aline, helped her start a business, and nurtured her spirit with the lessons of Maison Shalom. <laughs> I can forgive because I was raised with so much love. God forgives my sins, so how can I not forgive those who hurt me? Reconciliation and forgiveness run deep at Maison Shalom, a place where Albert, a Hutu, and Mediatrice, a Tutsi, can grow up as brother and sister. God created us to be equal and not to be separated by ethnicity. So at Maison Shalom, we all live as children of God. One of Maggie's biggest dreams is just now coming true. A new hospital, open to all regardless of their ability to pay. There will be fewer orphans, she says, and a brighter future if mothers are cared for right now. 
new operating rooms are under construction, a nursing school is almost finished, ambulance service is available for the first time ever. Maggie encourages all, including mothers living with HIV, to stand up, work hard, and support one another. I believe in this dignity that God gives us. We want peace. We want love. We believe in that. Maggie says love has made her an inventor. So she's never married, never confined herself to traditional limits. Woman must stay home behind, not in front. And Maggie going in front. <laughs> I pray for Maggie, and I thank God for her. I wish we had mamas like Maggie all over Burundi. <laughs> Most people in Burundi live on less than a single dollar a day. But Maggie insists it is not a poor country, but rich with promise. Her life is God's, she says. Her work has touched more than 30,000 children. They rebuilt my heart. They give me hope. She is the living proof of what one person of faith can do to bring peace and hope to the world. I know that Eva will never take the last word. Never, never a new generation is coming. I am not a dreamer. No, no, it's real. We, we are one family, one human family. In 2016, Maggie won the Aurora Prize. The Aurora Prize for Awakening Humanity is a new global award that is given annually to individuals who put themselves at risk to enable others to survive. It's a pioneering global initiative seeking to express gratitude to those who put themselves at risk to save Armenians from genocide 100 years ago. So there are some important things to note about Maggie in the context of lament. After the massacre, she experienced an incredible energy, determination, and anger, all of which she turned into setting up Maison Shalom. But what was the key driver for her? <coughs> Any ideas? Love. The key driver for her was love. We've heard about love this morning from Emma's Bible study. She operates out of an excess of love, which is a basic theological principle for her, and it was love that made her an innovator. She claims, love made me an inventor. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. Love made me an inventor. I think that is absolutely fantastic. What can we innovate and invent because of love? In the face of all this trauma, she improvised and innovated so that children could survive, and not only survive, but flourish. She invented a new community, not only Tutsi or Hutu, but a community beyond tribalism. And she came up with very practical ideas for the children, workshops, a salon, a cinema, a hospital, and a swimming pool. Her, and, but her love was deepened through her grief and lament. There's something about pain and suffering that is at the heart of love. It's our gospel, isn't it? That's the cross. There is some, that is the Eucharist. There is something about pain and suffering that's at the heart of love. There are things that can be seen only with eyes that have cried. In the midst of the civil war in Eastern Congo, this Roman Catholic Archbishop Muzihiwa worked for peace and to build structures of justice, forgiveness, and love. He experienced the war, the ethnic violence, the refugee crisis, the destruction of Bukavu. He was a prophet for a new vision of society, but after only two years of Archbishop, he was assassinated shot dead at a checkpoint. There are things that can be seen only with eyes that have cried. 
Out of the pain and intense suffering and anger, Maggie found the courage to take risks and to innovate. She was determined that death and evil would never have the last word because she innovated something new, she invented something new which offered newness and hope because ultimately love wins. And I was talking at breakfast with Lusa about the word for love in his language. Lusa, where are you? Can you just tell us about love in your language? Uh, the, the, the word love in my language, which is kiluba, uh, has got the same roots as the word pain. So when we speak of loving, we, may, we, say, we use exactly the same word as when we talk of suffering. So we can't love without suffering, and we can't suffer without loving. So love and pain, love and suffering, two sides of the same coin. Eva will never have the last word because love wins. And it's, I want us to remember this. It is vital to remember this because I now need to offer a sad PS to Maggie's story. And in a way, for me, this makes the story more real because it's not a happy ending ever after story. So in 2015, two years ago, President Pierre in Kurunziza, the president of Burundi decided to run for a third term. I don't know if you remember this. This plunged the country into crisis. Thousands fled, hundreds were arrested, many were killed. Maggie spoke out strongly against her standing for a third term, overriding the constitution. She was targeted and she fled into exile where she still is. She's living and working now in Rwanda. The government has shut down all the Maison Shalom programs including the schools and hospital in Ruigi, closed the bank accounts, confiscated all the assets. They have also killed some of the children. So it's not a happy ever after story, is it? But I think we do what we can when we can. And she did that. And love wins. So these events, those events have obviously deepened Maggie's lament. Katongale states that these events call for a closer exploration of the interconnection between lament and martyrdom in order to highlight the strange hope that the death of the innocent offers to Christians in their struggle for peace in Africa. And of course, today we're remembering the martyrdom of Bishop John Patterson and other Melanesian martyrs. So I guess this is a hard road. This is the road to which God calls us. This is the road that Jesus walked. Most of us in Leicester Diocese probably aren't going to be called to martyrdom. But in different ways, we are called to stand in solidarity with the suffering and the traumatised and the abused and the afflicted and go with God wherever that may lead us. So finally, to cheer us up a bit. <laughs> Newness and hope. So we've already noted that lament can have a surprising turn to praise. However, they're not just, lament and praise are not just simply juxtaposed. Rather, there can be an unexpected movement which brings about a fresh perspective and new language. So this possibility of lament turning into praise reflects a transformation and innovation. Innovation again, invention a novelty that is only possible with the articulation of both pain and belief. Biblical lament has the potential to bring us to a new place, to a new depth, to a new song of praise, which is qualitatively, qualitatively different from that which has gone before. It's a new kind of depth of knowledge and experience, only made possible by the experience of the suffering and pain. There's no shortcut. It's a new kind of depth of knowledge and experience only made possible by the experience of the suffering and pain. It is a new kind of seeing, a kind of seeing emerging from pain and suffering and anguish. There are things that can only be seen with eyes that have cried. And I think actually for you guys in ordained ministry, I'm not ordained, you're all mostly in parishes and, and working in pastoral situations, I think that's an important insight in pastoral ministry, that there's newness and hope after the pain. But it will be different, and we will only arrive there because of the pain. 
Maybe Pope Francis's metaphor of the church as field hospital is appropriate here, repairing the brokenness and healing the wounds. Not that we are the sole actors in this regard, obviously, but we do offer, perhaps the difference that we as Christians, as the church can bring, is this theological grammar of hope, our language of hope. By standing alongside those who are suffering, by being with and not doing for, or doing to, as Sam Wells so eloquently expressed in his book in Nazareth Manifesto, by being with, being present, being alongside, the first part of your little mantra, presence, being with, not doing to and for, by standing alongside those who are suffering, by being with, we participate in the mystery of God's own suffering, death and resurrection. And it's this participation that mysteriously releases hope. Katongale claims that the African church is a unique gift to world Christianity, as a laboratory of hope, which provides a living witness of what hope looks like in the context of violence and war. So to conclude, and then I've just got a couple of questions for you to finish with, are we able in our own context to be a field hospital, if you like that metaphor, that heals and binds the wounds, stands in solidarity with the afflicted and traumatized, challenges injustice and innovates to offer hope and bring about newness. You heard this morning from Bishop Martin that was it 20% of people in Leicestershire are in debt. We're not all in white middle class bubbles. And of course, even white middle class people suffer. There's pain and trauma and suffering everywhere. We know that, that is the human condition. Are we able to stand alongside, be in solidarity with the afflicted, the traumatized? And challenge injustice like Maggie did, innovate, invent. This is something that I learned from the pioneers actually, is about invention and taking risk. Give it a go, try something new. If it fails, it doesn't matter. Have a go, be risky, innovate. I read a really great book recently by Will Gompitz, you know, Radio 4 arts commentator. Uh, now, what's the title? Um, Think like an artist. So think like an artist and how to leave how to lead a more productive life. It sounds like some ghastly self-help book. In fact, when I went into Blackwells to try to find it, it was in the self-help section. But it has these ten points about how to think like an artist. And I always use these at Cudston and say replace artist with priest or minister or pastor, whatever you like. And I don't know if I remember the ten points, but they're things like artists, ministers, priests take risks. Ministers are entrepreneurial. Artists, ministers never fail. Okay, you might fail, you might make a mistake, but you need to learn for that and you have another go. You see the big picture, you see fine detail, all these ideas, innovate, risky, creativity, and in a way, lament calls us to that, to take risks. We saw that with Maggie, what she did, what one person can do with God's spirit and strength with her. So are we able in our context to be a field hospital that heals and binds the wound, stands in solidarity, be afflicted and traumatised, challenges injustice, and innovates to offer hope and bring about newness? So let me conclude with a poem, and then I've got a couple of questions if you want to take a couple of minutes to talk around them in your tables or talk about them over coffee. This is a poem, or part of a poem, because it's a long poem, by Denise Levitov. How could we tire of hope? How could we? So much is in bud. There is too much broken that must be mended. Too much hurt we have done to each other that cannot yet be forgiven. So much is unfolding that must complete its gesture. So much is in bud. And these are the questions if you want to take a few minutes around your table or maybe you just want some silence or maybe you're gasping for coffee. How could lament lead to newness and hope in your context? And love made me an inventor. How might that idea play out in your context? Thank you for your attention.